Now you go to Daytona and you wind up on your lead yeah. a couple of times. Was that kind of your welcome to the big leagues moment? And you said on your podcast that after that, you know, you had some issues, physical issues. Was there ever a moment of panic after that? Am I ready for this? Uh, I was embarrassed. I'm green as can be. I'm not a driver and never was a driver that figured a lot of this stuff out on his own. If I was going to be good at something, I needed a cheerleader and I needed a couple people feeding me information. I wasn't smart enough to even realize that my, you know, pulling off pit road for qualifying, I needed to get up to speed as fast as possible because that was going to really be the speed I would sustain and yeah. gain as the yeah. run. So I pull off pit road, just moseying off pit road through the gears, and Tony Sr. <laughs> comes over the radio and goes, what in the hell are you doing? <laughs> Go, get going. Why are you going off pit road so slow? We qualified third. He goes, you got the damn pole. If we had went off pit road, you got to go. You know, you can't just take it easy. I thought, well, you know, it's got enough power. Once I get going, it'll be it'll be fine. You know, I just didn't know any better. Yeah. That you needed to charge off pit road, all you know, for plate racing in Daytona specifically. So those are the, that's like an uh, an example of sort of how over my head I was. Yeah. You know, so we get going and and uh, they're telling me over and over and over, when you get into the pits, this thing's got a weird first gear. You're gonna have to really spin them tires or to not choke it, yeah. not cut it off. And they beat that into my brain. And so I'm thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know, I'm coming into pit road. I'm not nervous about hitting somebody, which I did. I ran into Kevin Pinnell, knocked him over the, over the hood. <laughs> I'm not nervous about missing my stall or anything. I'm more worried about stalling the car, trying to get out and losing all this track position. And so when I went to take off, I dropped the clutch and broke the yoke off the rear end housing. And we had to go behind the wall and fix it. And they, so I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, and think, you know, this is my fault. They put the car back together, and they're like, go back out there and just get some experience. And I'm like, okay. So I get up in there, and I'm racing with, you know, lap, lap, many laps down, 30 laps down. I don't know how many laps, that, laps down we are. But I'm out there, and I'm drafting with Dick Trickle, and there's a bunch of guys around me, and Buckshot Jones is there. Well, that's all you need to say. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got up beside Trickle. I had, a good, I had a really great car. Um, and Buckshot Jones got went in to draft behind – trickle and turn left and hit me in the quarter panel which turned me into trickle and spun us out and uh i mean it all happened i'm like i don't know how that happened you know i'm yeah. here i am going backwards and and flipping and carrying on and then i got i banged my head on the on the door on the door top bent the door top down and helmet bashed into it and uh because when it came down on the left front, I just went into the door. And so I got dizzy at the interview afterwards, and we laughed it off. Ah, uh, just a little bit woozy. Got banged around in there just a little bit. We thought, yeah. oh, man, wow, I'm dizzy. And I remember in the, I remember laying in the car. They let me work on the car a little bit. I was in, in, in the car the next week under the dash doing some wiring, and felt like that somebody would roll the car across the, con- or across the whole shop. Felt like the car just took off rolling, like somebody grabbed it and was pushing it because we had it on casters. And I thought they maybe didn't see me in there, and they were moving the car into uh, to to make room for another car or something. And I set up, and there was nobody around. The car wasn't moving at all, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm still I'm the one messed up more and messed up than I thought, you know, as far as my head. And uh, but next weekend, I I didn't think nothing of it, and uh, went to the racetrack, felt fine. But um, I I think that I was embarrassed, but I did chalk it up to Daytona. I think that the moment was bigger than me, and I was in over my head no matter how much experience I would have had. Everybody that goes to Daytona, if you look at my track record, even though we went, we went and won races at Texas, uh, but every time we went back to Talladega and Daytona, we crashed or we had, we had a problem. Because I couldn't – you got to go – it's like Martinsville. You got to go there and mess it up a bunch before you yeah. figure out how to do it right. right. No, but I don't know many people if that go to Daytona and just – pop win a race right out of the gate and if they do it's it's more chance than they knew what they were doing you know what i'm saying so the first i remember being so frustrated because dad was so great at those two tracks talladega and daytona and i remember going there in the xfinity series for the first three or four races and just never finishing crashing and not doing the right thing to, to stay we'd qualify well and i couldn't do the right things in the draft to keep my track position and in 10 laps, I'm running 25th and, and three wide, and then, and then the wreck happens, and I'm in it. 
And I'm like, God, I got to figure out how to stay up there. Yeah. Like, how yeah, do I stay yeah. up there? What's What am I doing wrong? I couldn't figure it out. It's so frustrating. And then eventually you do. You go to Las Vegas, and I'm watching from the press box. And on that last lap, you're all over Jimmy Spencer. Yeah. Man, I wanted you to give him I a shot. To, <laughs> I, if I'd have known any better, I would have. <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. Like, So I got to Jimmy, and I wasn't I – wasn't, experienced enough to know even how to move him out of the way if that makes any sense and i and i thought i gave him enough pressure that that would have moved me out of the way you know but it didn't bother jimmy and i also didn't know which i learned years later i didn't know how big a moment that was you know i still i wasn't sitting there going man i can't wait to my first win you know i'm sitting there running second going i can't believe i'm running second (laughs) you know what i mean I I have that was another thing too, and that I that I that I think is different about me than than is a lot of drivers is I was sitting there freaking out that I was even running good, you know, because I'd gotten in the car, we had the trouble at Daytona, I'd had such a difficult sort of struggle to find success and consistency beyond you know, before that with all the other racing I'd ever did. Here I am, like running second, thinking. Oh my God! I don't. How, how did I get here? How do I? Be, you know, how do, do I belong here? Or I was just overwhelmed with doing good. What did that do for your confidence level? Right. Yeah. You know, I th- that made you know. I got a car. Tony Junior smiling. Tony Senior smiling. And uh, you know, everybody was happy. But everybody did say, you know, man, I wish you'd have moved him. You know, you had the chance <laughs> to put the bumper to him right there. You know, that's a big race. It is Las Vegas, and I'm like, I don't know. Is it? Is it a big race? <laughs> I'm like, man, second's pretty awesome. I didn't know if I was gonna ha- have a job. You know, this is incredible. I didn't even know if I was gonna have a career. You know, <laughs> and yeah. so I'm sitting there just thanking my lucky stars. Now, you know, 10, 20 years later in my career, as I got down the line and realized, oh, man, what if I'd have been, you know, really yeah. taken advantage of the situation there and moved him out of the way and won that race? Holy moly. Uh, would that have been a big deal? Tony Jr. had bet on us, gambled uh, at the <laughs> casino, on us, and he taped that to the dash, and I oh, didn't wow. ever see it. I got in the car. That's the thing. I've, they, they, they would do stuff to the interior of the car, put stickers in there, tape you know, gambling tickets and stuff like that, or they put that volleyball in there over that year. I would never see it. <laughs> I'd get in the car, put on my helmet, put on my seatbelts, buckle in, I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm racing, <laughs> and they're like, hey, do you see such and such? I'm like, no, what are you talking about? You know? and he's like, did you not see that ticket in there? I was like, no, what do you mean? He's like, I put a, I put a, 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 a put some money down on us, and if you'd have moved him, we'd have won X. And I'm like, dang, you should have told me that before the race or at least in the last <laughs> 10 laps. I'd have maybe moved him to help Tony Jr. win the ticket. So you finished second at Las Vegas. Yep. You finished second at Bristol behind Elliott Sadler. Yeah. Then you go to Texas. Yeah. What do you remember about that? Well, I remember that we weren't, you know, we weren't all, we weren't really in position to win uh, for most of the day. We had a, we got in some contact in the middle of the race and had a tire rub that we had to come fix. Lost a lot of track position because of that. The left front fender was pushed in. They let him ride around here for a few laps to see if it wouldn't be a problem. He came in. It was a wise strategy. That left front tire would have gone down. But right now, Bernard's in the back. But it was some real smart pit strategy late in that race that put us on newer tires. And the strategy is going to be different than anything you have seen so far. Earnhardt is going to pit. He is going to take four tires. And guess who called the strategy? Dad from on top of the hauler. Um, back in that series, so you know, and then you had Mark Martin, who was unbeatable in the Winn Dixie car. <laughs> and if he wasn't, if he wasn't there, then Joe Nemechek was there, who was unbeatable in his car. And you're, you know, you're just trying your guts out to keep up with those two two cars. And uh, we got a chance to come down pit road and put on tires, and and Joe had the confidence in his car not to pit and. You know, we took advantage of it. But I remember, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I had run second a couple times, and I think that second place at Bristol, even though that was a great accomplishment for me, I personally got out of that car after Bristol and was like, I'm proud of myself. This is a hard race to finish. Yeah. I, I'm, wrecking, I'm wrecking it, Daytona, and I'm, 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 
you know, I'm having trouble finishing and completing races, and this is a tough one. Now, if I can finish second here and complete this race and run the laps and be good and not make mistakes and all the opportunities that you have to make mistakes at Bristol, I'm, I'm making some gains. But I'm tired of running second already. And so I think that's why I maybe was more aggressive to get to get by Nemechek than I was with Spencer. Um, you know, in just that short period of time, a couple of weeks there, I had gained the understanding of, man, I'm going to have to – force my way around these guys they're not going to roll over and let you let you just have it and he didn't want to you know he didn't want to move out of the way but um i just remember thinking that you know in the middle of that race man we're gonna have to work hard to get back in the top 10 get back in the top five to have a decent finish not thinking that we had a winning car and then being you know on that late strategy and when i mashed the gas and took off i'm thinking, wow this thing's faster than anything here <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. this around I'm the lead's right there, and I'm I'm catching them. You know, I'm coming. Like, yeah. we got to sh- we, we might win this race. You know, and so uh, and it all worked out. The funny thing is, is in my mind, I thought I just need to win one race. If I can win one race, I'll have this job forever. That's all I tried. I'm thinking I I just want to win one race, and I'll have this job forever. I didn't think beyond that first win. You know, for whatever reason, that's just the mindset. That's the mentality that I had. And uh, I'm thinking as soon as I won it, I'm like, this ought to keep me employed as a driver for a really (laughs) long time. (laughs) That was the thought. It wasn't where's the next race we're going to win or, man, I want to win the championship. Or or the the only thought I had was dad's happy and this should do it. This should give me employment. Uh, I won't have to worry about my bills. You can ask Kelly. Up until the middle of 98, I was delinquent on bills. They were giving notices to me about shutting my power and my phone off. Um, we were, you know, we had, we were, I was minimum balance in the bank, you know, keeping that, you know, 200 bucks or whatever you had to have to, so they didn't give you a fine, a penalty. Um, we won Texas, and I got a couple thousand dollars. And went straight to the bank. I was living in a double wide trailer with a buddy of mine. We went well. Actually, we went straight to the power bill. Power. The, there was a strip mall where you paid your power bill. First race at Texas that we won. I got two thousand dollars. We went and paid our power bill, and we bought an entertainment system. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Spent it all right there. And so, um, you know, I, I've. It was a big change in lifestyle. It was a big change in my bank account. Immediately, it all was overnight. Um, and I didn't know what I had. I didn't know what was coming. Uh, that's why Kelly ended up coming yeah, to work for me. Yeah. She's like, "Holy moly! All this is you got. You you need somebody because there's there was papers and bills and checks and things just piling up. And uh, you know, so it was a bit of a whirlwind for me. Well, the first Dover race, uh, talking about a turning point. I think you spun trying to pit halfway yeah. through the race, but you came back to win it. And that had to be a tremendous turning point for you because you finished out of the top ten just four times for the rest of the year. Yeah, we were, uh, you know, I was gaining confidence in me. I was gaining tons of confidence in our cars. Like, they're going to show up and be comfortable. I was no longer, when the race, when the season started, I was thinking, I don't know the tracks. I don't know how the car's going to feel. I don't know how hard this is going to be. Uh, I don't know how how well I'll be able to help Tony Jr. Tony Sr. understand what I need, and then by this point, by Dover, I'm comfortable with the cars. Confident that every time we show up to the racetrack, we're going to be one of the top three cars. I'm confident that if you know if I just don't screw it up, that we're going to finish well and maybe win. You know, and you know, so it started. My anxiety level was way down, and confidence is through the roof. Tony Sr. and Tony Jr. are extremely confident in themselves uh no matter what's happening they feel like that their car is the best car there they feel like that there's no reason why that car shouldn't be the best car the fastest car in practice and qualifying in the race there's there's no reason and so that i you know that drove and pushed me they gave me they made me feel like them i started adapting their sort of feeling about our cars and our team we're the best we should win. Uh, there's nobody here that's as good as we are and builds great cars like we have. Nobody's car is as nice as my car, as ready as my car, as prepared as my car is. And uh, you go to the racetrack like that, and and that's that's man in racing that is half of the battle, the confidence. You can you can have the best race car in the trailer, the best setup, um, but if you don't believe in it, you're not going to do what you need to do with it. 
You're not going to take the risk that you have to take. You're not going to drive that car with the confidence down into the corner that you need. And once I started gaining my own confidence in myself and the car, we really started clicking as a team. I still feel like that there were a lot of shortcomings on my end as a driver, a lot of inexperience that we overcame just because of Tony Senior, Tony Junior's professionalism and our teams uh, was stacked. They brought it. You know, they had a. They were really good at putting a lot of great guys around us. Cars were amazing. Our engines from Hutter were just incredible. So much power, and uh, that was helpful. Those engines were we. You know, Tony Senior, Tony Junior bragging on the motors all the time. Gave me confidence in our motors. Believed it, we had the best motor in the garage. You know, you just you get that ball rolling, and and it's and it gets a lot of momentum. So even when we have a stumble. We were still the fastest car before that happened. Um, if I didn't, you know, I made that mistake coming on the pit road at Dover, and it's hard entry, hard pit. Everybody sort of makes a mistake there at some point in their career. And, um, man, I was racing Bobby Hillen all day long for that race. He was a strong car there running the top. I couldn't figure out how to run the top with him, so I had to try to figure out a way to, how to pass him on the bottom, and that was kind of tough. Um, because I'd watched him all my life in the 80s growing up as a kid, so it was pretty cool to race him for, for, for that for most of the majority of that day. Another tough racetrack, Dover is intimidating, you know. But when you check that box and, and go to that Dover, that Bristol, that you know those tracks like Darlington, running second to trickle at Darlington, things like that, when you, when you go to those places and you, you get, get a reasonable result, it makes you proud. It, it, it makes you, you, you feel like, man, I, I, might, I might be able to make a living doing this. You know, this ain't just a flash in the pan here. This could be something long term. So, Pikes Peak, Tony Stewart gets into you. Yeah. And you wind up in the wall. And I have this memory after the race of being at the back of the NASCAR hauler. I'm trying my best to see inside mm-hmm. and see what's happening. Yep. The statute of limitations has long since passed. Yeah, sure. What happened? So in we, the truck. Okay. <laughs> so we got in the truck and I was um I was standing there with Tony Senior. So in the hauler you walk into the back of it. There's this long aisle up toward the front, and then there's a lounge in the front. There's some steps up into that lounge. Me and Tony Sr. are at the bottom of the steps. You don't go into the lounge until they tell you to. That's where the officials are. That's where Helton or whoever's going to be up yeah. in there. They'll tell you when to come into that lounge. You don't go up in there and sit down. So we're standing at the bottom of the steps. Wait, we're the first ones for this meeting, apparently. The officials are still coming down from the press box. Tony, Tony Stewart comes in there, and he walks in. And he he kind of is like, man, this is not a big deal, you know. This this is he's not happy. I'm not happy. Tony Senior's not happy. But Tony Stewart came in with like, we're gonna maybe you know the look on his face like we might work this out. And then about five feet behind him, his crew chief came in, and I can't remember the guy's name. Brian Brian Frazier yeah, Frazier. Yeah. He come in, and when he when the door cracked, <laughs> I could hear him talking, and he was saying things like. Riding his daddy's coattail. Oh, uh, boom. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was saying things like spoiled brat. Oh, my God. Silver spoon. Mm. Handed everything. Oh. And he just kept you going. You should have decked him. He was going. <laughs> he was doing that. He was saying that on the way in. And as he's walking that aisle toward me, he's saying it. And so wow. Tony Stewart and me are sort of standing face to face. Yeah. He's facing me. I went over the top of Tony Stewart and grabbed <laughs> Frazier by the shirt. And Frazier backed up, and Tony Stewart sort of was pushing me away. And his, I ripped Frazier's shirt off. And I swung at him uh, with my right hand to pop him. And as we were backing away, I missed. I, my, I didn't have the length. And you hit John Darby. <laughs> you know? And then Tony Sr. jumped in. Oh. Uh, to, now it's a ball game. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I'm trying to hit Frazier, uh, and Tony Sr. and Tony Jr. Are just kind of r- grabbing to, to yeah. sort of break yeah. up or pull or holler. Everybody's hollering. But I wanted to hit, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, if I saw, if I saw Brian Frazier today, I wouldn't have a problem. I could talk to him and laugh about it. But in that moment, all I wanted to do was hit that man in the face as many times as I could. <laughs> and I would, I, Tony Stewart wasn't even in the back of my mind. Yeah. I had no problem with Tony. We raced on the track. I pushed him a lot. I ran into him about 15 times in that race, and he finally popped me on a restart and shoved me into the wall in turn one and two. That's racing. You yeah. know, I wasn't happy about it. You don't, never get, you don't never get out of the car and go, oh, no big deal. But 
I didn't like what that. I wasn't running my mouth to Tony, and Tony running and running his mouth to me. The only person that was running his mouth was this Fraser guy, and I had never met the man. I didn't know him from Adam, and yeah. he didn't know me, and so it just really set me off. So. And plus, he was my size, maybe a little smaller. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't as big as Tony. I know that. Over the last few weeks of the season, you start pulling away from Matt Kenseth mm-hmm. in the standings. Was there a specific point where you begin to feel like the championship might actually happen, or did you not even want to think about that? I can't remember uh, trying to think. Um, I remember more that fe- I remember that feeling more around that second championship in 99 but the first one you know i think i think i started we got down toward the race the the end of the season i started looking at our difference in points to matt and started doing the math and feeling more and more confident like man you know as long as we don't have an engine failure or something big like it's going to really give us a, a miserable result to give up all them points that we should be pretty comfortable um you know, and I felt like, you know, Matt, I, you know, with Matt, his, you know, Matt was an overachiever in my mind with his yeah. team. You know, yeah. he, they, they did have the, they, they did have some support from Roush, but that wasn't a Ford. That was a Chevrolet owned by Robbie Riser. And Robbie had built that team and, 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 um, you know, they were getting some help, but not that yeah. much help. And, uh, not, not like I was getting. Not, I mean, I had, you know, I had a cup team. Over in another garage with part driving it, and it, you know, and and we just we had great engines. I don't know what kind of power Matt had, but he didn't have the power I had. Um, and uh, I think I knew that our resources, you know, were were going to give us the edge and gave me the confidence in those last several races not to freak out, you know, not to panic. I wonder like uh, how Dad handled the nineteen eighty championship being so close and so tight going into ho- uh, Ontario with Kel Yarborough. I would have blew it you know and well, dad he almost tried, did. He, he tried know, to blow tried it to, yeah. <laughs> i know but he did his best <laughs> right um you know but i i had by that point in the career in the season gained so much confidence in tony senior and tony jr in the car and the motor and just the power and, and, and the, the momentum that barring any kind of major catastrophe and and you know we were we were in great shape basically all you had to do at homestead was start right and one thing that you said going into that race that I will never forget, you said, I guess it'll sink in once I see the look in my daddy's eyes. Yeah. Is there any way to describe the look in your daddy's eyes once everything was said and done at Homestead? Right. So all my life, um, you know, he's – all my life he has looked at me like, when's this kid going to figure it out? When's this kid going to show me something or, you know – quit disappointing me or whatever it is you know and and i guess as a father you just want your kids to be excellent and you want them to excel and you want them to show initiative and drive and determination and i maybe wasn't showing him what he was looking for and you sort of i sort of get aggravated with my guys because carrie and dale jr is they tear up their car and it's not really they i don't know whether they don't seem as interested as i did when i was starting about fixing it about fixing it yeah is fired up because usually I tore mine up on Saturday night. I didn't have to tore apart on Sunday. and was putting it back together on Monday. Yeah. And these guys, they sort of hang around about Wednesday before they get going good on it and they get closer to a race, get thing about it, I reckon. But. And obviously I wasn't getting a lot of the results that I was hoping to get in the car up until 1998. And he was not the kind of person that would say, I love you a lot. He wasn't the kind of person that would give you a hug or put his arm around you. I mean, he put his arm around you, but more in a buddy kind of way. And, uh, when you were failed or when you were hurt or disappointed or, or got rejected by someone, um, he was he didn't have a lot of time for that, yeah. you know, and he knew you were going to get over it. He knew you were going to be fine. Um, and he was sort of tough love and he was who he was. You know, you, it, what the one, the person, you know, is who he was at home. He wasn't any different. And so I think that, um, I was just excited to finally, I knew, you know, if we start this race, win the championship, I knew there would be a point where I was going to see him later that day and I was going to probably see something new. And, um, I think th- that, you know, I, he was, I saw the pride, I saw the, I saw the love and, and the happiness and joy, um, that I'd hoped I would see. And, you know, I just wanted to do that. I just wanted to keep doing things that would keep bringing that 
reaction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was happy in the moment. We had fun in Victor Lane and, and I just was like, all right, I got to keep doing this. I got to keep, you know, making him happy and, and making him glad that he made these decisions, you know, to involve me in this, um, which wasn't a pressure type of deal. It wasn't like, oh, I got a lot of pressure on me to, to do this. I was just anxious to what's the next thing that me and Tony Sr. and Tony Jr. and all of us can do together to make dad happy. And so, um, but it was awesome. I mean, just being able to, I was doing something that I knew he had done a lot. You know, we were celebrating wins. We were celebrating a championship and we ride in the back of that truck at Homestead and all those little moments. I've been with him in those moments when he was doing that. It was his own career. I've been, I've celebrated championships and wins in victory circle and, and being able to be in that moment with him when the win was about, I was the driver. I'm here with Dylan Hart after he just won the Die Hard 500. What's the question, dude? <laughs> when I was with him before all those years, he was the center of the universe in Victor Lane or, or at the, you know, at the banquet speaking and all. And in those, I'm, I was, uh, you know, when I was at the banquet in 98, I got video, my favorite parts, video of him watching me speak. Huh. My, that's my favorite part of that whole experience was looking down there and watching him watch me on that stage. So, because I mean, it's just, it's just incredible to, because he's so, he was so hard to please. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. God, he was hard to please. 